Welcome to the Delft Economic uh, Forum, the seventh uh, Delft Economic Forum. I'm very glad to be here. Uh, we're going to have a discussion today about uh, democracy, the challenges that democracy is facing, and what the private sector can do about this. Um, it's a great uh, pleasure to have two very distinguished uh, panelists here. One is Martin Wolf. Martin Wolf is Martin Wolf. I don't think he needs any further introduction. I think he wanted John, Yanis Varoufakis on the panel as well, but uh, we didn't do him the favor. I'm just kidding. <laughs> and also Dimitris uh, Babalexopoulos, who is the head of the Greek Industrialist uh, Association. Um, let me ask you, Dimitri, first of all, do you feel that democracy is under threat? Do you think democracy is challenged? And what, what do you feel the private sector can do about it? Thank you, Alexi. And uh, let me start by saying it's clearly a risk to, to debate such an open-ended philosophical question in public with the likes of Martin Wolf and Alex Papakelas. But since I, since I was foolish enough to accept, l let me start by talking a little more narrowly about the role of business in, in our democracies. And, and what I would argue is that businesses are increasingly becoming actively engaged in societal challenges in response to society's expectations, that that is, generally speaking, a good thing, but it also carries with it a number of challenges and risks that one has to be aware of and manage. And I would like to start by sharing with you some of the ex some expert excerpts from the results of this year's Edelman Baro uh, Trust Barometer. For those of you who don't know it, Edelman Trust does an annual survey, a poll of about 36,000 people across 28 countries, all of the major economies are there. And, and here are four, of, I've picked four of the conclusions they wrote from this year's. So the first conclusion is that business is the most trusted institution of those surveyed ahead of NGOs, governments, and media. Apologies, gentlemen, although I'm sure it's not the FT or Cathimerini they were thinking about. Second. Business needs to step up on societal issues. Around the globe, the survey says business is not doing enough to address societal problems, including climate change, economic inequality, workforce reskilling, and trustworthy information. Third, societal leadership is now a core function of business, quote unquote. When considering a job, 60% of employees want their CEO to speak out on controversial issues they care about, and about 80% of the general population want CEOs to be personally visible when discussing public policy with external stakeholders. In particular, CEOs are expected to shape conversation and policy on jobs and the economy, on wage inequality, on technology and automation, on global warming and climate change. And fourth conclusion, business must lead in breaking the cycle of distrust across every single issue by a huge margin. People want more business engagement, not less. The role and expectation for business has never been clearer, and business must recognize that its societal role is here to stay. So that's a very clear direction of travel and very clear signal from society. And the reality is that the number of businesses are increasingly engaging with society, urged along by their customers, by their own employees, and by society at large. And they're increasingly departing from, from the uh, sort of the traditional orthodoxy of, uh, of, of, a, of another Martin, Martin uh, of many years ago, that the business of business is to stick to business in a narrow sense and, and serve shareholders. Okay. And I would personally argue that this is, generally speaking, a good thing. As we are trying to uh, rethink and evolve our democratic free market system that is increasingly under attack, both from within and from outside, we need the voice of business. We need all voices. We need, nobody can solve this alone. So business has a very important role to play in providing the entrepreneurship that drives economic growth, in providing jobs, in innovating and pushing, pushing the envelope of what is possible. It is a critical ingredient in any possible outcome. Having said all that, one has to be very careful what one wishes for, because that 
path we have embarked on is a very slippery slope. And I would like to just mention, to, to round up, three of the risks and challenges we have to face. First, there are clearly uh, conflicts of interest lurking. Companies have a fiduciary responsibility to their shareholders and are awarded to defend their interests. Moving away from a legal framework and a culture that has been long established over decades and has served us well over a long time in lifting the world out of poverty and enabling social and economic progress should not be lightly uh, departed from. Second, we risk a crowding out effect in the context of tough uh, competition, unrelenting competition on many fronts. Uh, Well-meaning companies could lose out to more scrupulous uh, competitors. And third, I think there is a legitimate discussion, a legitimate debate on how strong the voice of business should be, or as a matter of fact, is, is already in our democracies, in our democratic <coughs> process. So let me finish where I started. Business is getting more involved in societal issues. That is broadly a good thing, but there are serious side effects to be addressed. Great. Thank you, Dimitri. Well, Martin, I want to ask you, with the end of the pandemic, with what's going on now in Ukraine, it seems that the, the global order is going to be rewritten. And as you've written, some of the perverse dimensions of capitalism have also to be addressed, have to be corrected. So in, in this new landscape, what role do you see for the, for the private sector? What's the proper role for the private sector to play? So first of all, it's a great pleasure to be here, uh, always is, and uh, to participate in this really important discussion. And the reason I love this issue so much is that unlike almost everything else I'm engaged in discussing, I don't actually know what I think. So I find that's much more fun because I sort of, I listen, I find myself in ag agreement with a large part, in fact, the dominant part of what you said. Um, my response to your questions are, uh, we clearly, um, I'll just fi finish the book on this, we, we have gone through in, uh, the world economy, and very particularly the developed countries, which I focus on for the, the Europe and America, I'll focus on this because there's so much more to say. Three enormous, unexpected, each, maybe they should have been, but unexpected shocks in the last 15 years. The financial crisis, the um, COVID crisis, and now the war. And I don't think one can separate their impacts out. They're cumulative. And furthermore, those shocks followed a long period in which it would be fair to say that overall growth was disappointing, productivity growth was modest, and in most countries, to a greater or less extent, the economy became more unequal with a very large part of the gains, not all, and, um, accruing to a relatively small part of the population. Um, and one of the characteristic consequences of this, again, in our countries, I'm not familiar, is a rise of populism. Um, we, this is well known. And what was called by Larry, Larry Diamond, uh, the great scholar of democracy in the, uh, in the, um, at the Hoover Institute in Stanford, a democratic recession, which has been going on for a long time. And uh, uh, other surveys, the World Value Survey, for instance, indicates a growing scepticism about democracy. And I think it's that long period uh, um, problem that I've been addressing, and I've just finished a book on it. So to my answer to you is, while on your particular question, while the shock of the war has clearly created a short-term, an immediate coming together of the democratic West in revulsion, perfectly understandable, horror and fear, it's not at all clear to me that the longer term consequences, well, medium to longer term consequences, which I think are going to be pretty terrible. You know, we've got the inflation problem has got much worse. Real income problems are going to get much worse. Uh, uh, the governments of the Western world really don't have any strategies 
to deal with these problems effectively in the short term. And I wouldn't be very surprised, therefore, just to close, if at the end of the day, the disenchantment of a large part of our populations, uh, the left behind, as we, we call, been calling them, will not increase dramatically. And if you look at the polls, which I've just been doing today in the French election, and the possible outcome in the second round between Ma Macron and Marine Le Pen, they would suggest the disenchantment is very profound and the problem that we've been facing far from getting better because Mr. Putin is bringing us together, uh, but rather we could get worse because we're going to have to suffer a big series of negative shocks. And the truth probably is that the large proportion of the population will be very badly hit. I can go to that in detail, but I won't any further. Uh, while very well off, we're going to do fine. And that will be a big problem for democracy. I know that you read Plato coming down uh, to, yep. uh, to Greece. So my question is, I mean, the way you describe it is you see a risk of an implosion of the West, just like Athens imploded at some point, right? Is, is, is that right? Well, in the end, uh, uh, Plato was describing his ideal type of what could go wrong in a, a democratic republic in the Republic, which is a pretty amazing book I've rediscovered. Uh, um, uh, the, uh, the, I started writing a book in 2016. It's taken me a very long time to finish for many reasons, one of them being that things change all the time. And I wrote it because of the obvious. And I wrote, started writing before Trump was elected, since I was sure he was going to be elected. And I was addressing the question, why should uh, the core of the Democratic West be interested in electing a bumptious, bumptious ignorant populist like Trump? That's pretty quite an important question. And so Plato discusses this in the Republic. Uh, why would a demagogue be elected or be by the people? Um, and you know all about that in the history of Athens. I mean, dem, dem, the old ancient Athens. Um, why should such people be elected? And his answer was, because the majority of the people in certain circumstances feel they needed a protector from predatory elites. That's exactly his description. And, the, and some of these, these protectors are pretty unsavory people in every possible dimension. And he describes this sort of protector. The and old oligarchs. And, he, profounds, yes, he, and, he, and it turns out that Trump fits his, fits his description sensationally well which uh, would surprise me. But anyway, the point is, once the elites, the oligarchy, if you like, and in our case, it would obviously be business elites and so forth, sort of are no longer as trusted as worse they were, and particularly the policies they recommended are less pop uh, trusted than they were. And I'm not entirely sure I believe the Edelman Values Survey, but that may be right. But anyway, once they are distrusted, and people then are looking for alternatives, it is clear from the history of democracy that one of the most attractive of alternatives is a populist. It could be a left-wing populist, like Hugo Chavez. It could be a right-wing populist who says, it's all very simple. The elites are screwing you. Support us. The elites are screwing you, and maybe also immigrants, foreigners, ethnic minorities. It's sort of a mixture. And we can solve the problem as long as you give me all the power. Now, that's not exactly unheard of, and, it, and it's a big part of the discussion of the history of Athens, and it seems to me a big part of what is happening now. Now, this takes us a long way from the role of business, but it seems to me a big part of what is happening now. That I met Marine Le Pen. She's rather good at this. And the trouble is that populists never know actually how to make things better. They make them worse, and then you get into a vicious spiral of worsening in economic performance, more anger, and so forth. And by the way, that's, I think, what Brexit is leading us to. Okay. I think one of the, the, the main threats of democracy, I mean, uh, Martin described this very well, is you know, stagfl stagflation, the sense of you know, the living standards really uh, not being able to, to be met anymore and all this. How does the private sector address this problem? Well, it, it is true, and I... I'm afraid I fully share Martin's analysis that, that uh, the way our economies have, has, have evolved in the last few decades, we have created tremendous wealth. Uh, the economies have grown. 
but that has been very unevenly distributed. A huge part of society has been left behind. And I'm afraid that, that the challenges posed by technology, as much as globalization, are continuing to drive that. This issue is not going away easily. It's not going away quickly. It cannot be addressed uh, uh, yeah. in any simple way. We have five minutes, so I have to compress everything. Oh, sorry. To, yeah. Such big questions. Uh, yeah, I know. Well, so, uh, so I, you know, I, I think... We're all going to leave by here, you know, being a real optimist. I promise you that after this conversation. So, yeah. so, uh, so I think, as I said earlier, we, we all have a role to play. Mm -hmm. uh, business has to, has to become involved okay. in those discussions and play a more constructive role. But the lead has to be with, with, with society at large. And, and the encouraging thing in my mind from the Edelman barometer, regardless of how you judge specific results, is that society is exercising pressure on business uh, yeah. to, to react. Is globalization dead? No. Uh, no. No, I mean, the, the, the way I've written about it uh, five years ago is it's sleeping, as it were. That is to say, globalization as a process of ever greater integration ha unquestionably has stopped, ever greater integration. The question I have is, uh, have is how much it might reverse. It will certainly not reverse fully. It's completely impossible uh, for reasons I don't have enough time to, God, I don't, uh, to explain. But I do expect some important aspects of globalization to diminish now. And I think the most important one of that, there are many others, uh, is that the integration of the Chinese economy in depth with the economies of Europe and North America will diminish. It will certainly not disappear. It will diminish because it is clear that the thrust towards what is called strategic autonomy in central technologies which have military and security aspects is an overwhelming one and those are a lot of technologies. So there I think will be some decoupling from China. I'm just trying to predict that. The extent of it we don't know and it was basically started under Trump. Dimitri? I, 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 I tend to agree. I have nothing valuable to add. Okay. Well, I want to ask you, I uh, only have like two minutes, so I want to start with you, Dimitri, and I want to, for you to define for us uh, what the priorities, what the characteristics should be for the ideal business elite. There's no, no overall one-size-fits-all answer. Uh, businesses react to incentives given, and incentives are given by both governments and societies. And, and so I think as a society, we must continue to strive to give businesses the right incentives. There is no one answer to your question. Martin? Well, the, since we only have two minutes, let me say one thing that is new to the discussion, because I agree with most of what, what uh, you said, and uh, Dimitri said. Um, I don't think business can solve the, the ills of society, and I don't believe business is entitled to solve the ills of society. That's what governments are for. And I think the fact that we want government business to solve all these problems shows just how useless our governments have become. And there is no substitute, ultimately, for politics, for dealing with things like climate change and so forth. What I do think is that uh, business needs not to do harm. Now, there are lots of activities uh, you talked about which are very good, and, well, you know, training and all the rest of it. But what do I mean doing harm? Uh, there is an enormous... Uh, stupendous amount of business finance lobbying activity uh, whose consequences is to make our tax systems completely ineffective, to make our regulatory systems an even bigger mess than they would otherwise be. I was very actively involved in our independent commission on banking and the regulatory system that evolved before the crisis under a lot of bank pressure from banking lobbies in our, my country, for example, was a disaster. Uh, the, uh, the, the role of business in shaping a labor market regulation or deregulation has, I think, often had undesirable consequences. So I would like businesses to focus on, uh, not on solving the problems of the world, but, not, but trying to avoid making the problems of the world worse. And this fits with Milton Friedman's main point, which was 
Business must operate within the rules of the game. My point against Milton is that's fine, but what if business creates rules of the game that distort the game? And that, in my view, and it's all over my book, is a very large part of the reality, and I'd like that to stop. The last question is no offense to anybody present here, but do you find that some of the best brains prefer the private sector rather than politics? Oh, of course. Why uh, is that? Uh, well, it pays much better and it's much less unpleasant. So on the really big point, I think we have a colossal crisis in every society I know of of the quality of people going into politics. In Britain, it's a catastrophe. Uh, I mean, every, I'm, I was born in the 40s. Every generation of British politicians, in my view, with a few exceptions, would be worse than the previous one. I'm not going to comment on any other country. Why and the, how do you run a democracy with incompetence? It, the, the, that's why I genuinely fear. It's not, unfortunately, not funny, but when we get rid of competent democratic politicians, we'll end up with incompetent populist politicians, and it'll be worse. Much, much worse. But as Not things get worse, we will get interesting people interested in politics again, and that will bring, eventually, better people back well, into play. Well, that happened in the 30s in America with FDR, but it is fragile, so I do try to encourage people to go into politics, but I, I, since I didn't do it myself, it's not a very convincing uh, recommendation. I can see your point. Okay, thank you very much. Thank, thank you. you.